She truly was one of a kind. Lee Cowan looks back on the extraordinary life and times of Elizabeth Alexandra Mary Windsor, Queen Elizabeth II. A few moments ago, Buckingham Palace announced the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Her death, even at 96, still came as a seismic shock. Not so much that Queen Elizabeth II was gone, but that her decades of stability and continuity were suddenly gone too. It's just a sad day. Just a very, very sad day. There are few alive today who remember a time without Queen Elizabeth. She was there during the Cold War, through the age of Twiggy and the Beatles, through wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. She adjusted to social media. She weathered Brexit. She survived COVID. I hope in the years to come, everyone will be able to take pride in how they responded to this challenge. And those who come after us will say the Britons of this generation were as strong as any. In her 70 years on the throne, she became one of the most recognizable, admired, and trusted figures in the world. And yet, as familiar as she was, the queen was largely unknowable. She had such a level of integrity and affection that many of us felt she really belonged to us and we belonged to her. Gavin Ashenden was the queen's chaplain for almost a decade. What was she like in private? Well, she was, she was actually an immensely intelligent and astute woman with a very dry wit. She didn't suffer fools gladly, and above all, was generous. There was no self-absorption about her. While some saw her as aloof, others saw her royal stiff upper lip as simply an outward expression of her role as a constitutional monarch. Having grown up in the Second World War, she belonged to a generation which just got on with it. She didn't believe in emoting in public. She didn't believe in complaining in public. That was not ever her style. Sir David Kennedy is a respected British author and historian. There is something about that mystery of the monarchy that, that served her well in a lot of ways. Yes, part of her charisma, I think, in the end, derived from the fact that we didn't really know what she thought about most things. And that gave her a particular kind of prestige, which I, I think is completely unique. Elizabeth Alexandra Mary Windsor wasn't born to be queen. It was one of those accidents of history. Her uncle, Edward VIII, abdicated to marry Wallace Simpson, an American divorcee. And that made Elizabeth's father king and her an heir. We know every one of us. At only 14, she took to the BBC to address children during World War II. When peace comes, remember, it will be for us, the children of today, to make the world of tomorrow a better and happier place. There was a poise, a willing acceptance of her royal duties even then. And at 21, long before she took the throne, she was already publicly pledging her loyalty to the realm. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service. Madam, is your majesty willing to take the oath? I am willing. She took her vows in public at Westminster Abbey, before a global TV audience of millions. Walter Cronkite reporting from London. A decision she made the against the advice of her very first prime minister, Winston Churchill. There was a huge sense of euphoria. Perhaps there was a new Elizabethan age about to unfold, and it was all terribly joyous and terribly wonderful. It wasn't always that way, of course. Of all her years on the throne, 1992, stood out for all the wrong reasons. The marriages of three of the Queen's four children collapsed, and a fire tore through historic Windsor Castle, a series of events that led her to speaking about as frankly as she ever did about her innermost thoughts. It has turned out to be an annus horribilis. More recently, there were more family difficulties. Prince Andrew, settled a civil lawsuit over allegations that he sexually assaulted a 17-year-old girl. And Prince Harry and his wife Meghan Markle moved to the States and gave up their royal duties. You could see her hurting when 
uh, some crisis or other overtook her children or her grandchildren, and there wasn't anything she could do about it apart from love them. But of all the tumultuous years, 1997 may have been the worst. The princess who spent her life in the relentless glare of the public eye died in a... The death of Princess Paris. Diana in a car crash in Paris was a point at which the queen's role as mother and grandmother clashed with her duties as head of state. She chose family, staying in Scotland at Balmoral Castle to tend to Diana's two children, Princes William and Harry. It was a decision some thought made her look out of touch, callous even, to the public mourning of a nation. Under pressure, Queen Elizabeth returned to London and gave a rare live address. I, for one, believe there are lessons to be drawn from her life and from the extraordinary and moving reaction to her death. Her popularity recovered to the point that today, most millennials remember nothing of the controversy over Diana's death, only that the queen responded. We realized that she was sort of an eccentric older lady in the style of a lot of other eccentric older ladies who I think millennials have a really particular love for. Erin Vanderhoof, staff writer at Vanity Fair and co-host of the podcast Dynasty, says while the queen may have reacted more to change than actually making change herself, she still became a part of pop culture. The two most famous examples of making her kind of more endearing even to a more counterculture set would be Andy Warhol's paintings of her, which are very fun. And of course, God Save the Queen by the Sex Pistols, which was banned by the BBC. God Save the Queen! The older the Queen got, the more it seemed she was willing to at least bend tradition. In 2009, when First Lady Michelle Obama put her arm around the Queen, protocol was shattered. You just don't touch the monarch. And yet, Queen Elizabeth responded, by embracing Michelle Obama right back. There are a lot of people who are looking to older women as style inspiration, but also life inspiration. And she just fits like right in that nexus in a way that a rediscovery of her was kind of inevitable. Tea? Oh, yes, please. She seemed more willing to show her sense of humor, too. This year, she had tea with Paddington Bay, revealing what she'd been carrying around in that ever-present handbag of hers all these years. Oh, so Paddington's I. favorite, a marmalade sandwich. I keep mine in here. Oh. For later. Thank you. Pull everything. That's very kind. When Prince Philip, the man whom she called her strength and her stay, died in 2021, the queen was already slowing down, but not much. She still appeared on the balcony this year to commemorate her 70 years of service, the first British monarch to ever celebrate a platinum jubilee. And just two days before she died, she was still carrying out those duties, meeting with Liz Truss at Balmoral, her 15th prime minister. But as much as tradition remains, change is afoot. The royal anthem it no longer mentions the queen. It's a king's turn to be saved now the first time in most of his subjects' memory.